So welcome to the second in our series of seminars, which um, is hosted by the Open University's Contemporary Cultures of Writing in conjunction with the Institute of English Studies at the School of Advanced Study, at the University of London. So my name's Joanne Reardon and I'm Senior Lecturer in Creative Writing here at the Open University. So before I introduce our chair for this evening, who will introduce the seminar, I'd just like to give you a little few little housekeeping notes if that's okay. So we'll hear both presentations first and there will be time for questions at the end. Um, however, as there's so many of us in here, it'd be really grateful if you could mute your microphones. Um, we meant to do it beforehand and I, I think I've missed a button somewhere. So that would be great if you could do that, please. Um, we'd ask you please as well to use the chat box. It's usually easier to ask questions. So if something occurs to you as the speakers are giving their presentations, just write it in there. Uh, myself and my colleagues will, will make a note of the questions and we can put them to the speakers at the end. Um, and we'll do as many as we can at the end. So we're recording the seminar, um, so which is all the more reason why to, <laughs> to ask you about the microphones, um, but we won't record the Q&A. So um, the recording will then be available very shortly after the end of the seminar, and it's available via our Contemporary Cultures of Writing website, and a link will be put in the chat box. Um, we'll put it during the seminar, and we can put it in again at the end. So you can activate a captions option by clicking uh, um, on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a link to that. And it'd be also helpful, I think, if we could keep videos off because it helps with the uh, broad with broadband width and everything. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, the chair for this evening's seminar, my colleague, Lindsay Chris. Um, I will um, pin her in a moment. Um, Lindsay is a member of the Art History Department at the Open University. She is an academic in cultural studies with a background in community arts, who writes about materiality, text and fragmentation in contemporary art. In her doctoral thesis, she uses ekphrastic writing as an investigative strategy to explore these themes as they arise, and particularly in the art event breakdown, in which the artist Michael Landy systematically catalogued and destroyed his own possessions. So I'm going to um, turn you up to Lindsay now uh, to introduce our speakers. Thank you very much, Joanne. Um, so during November, we're hosting three seminars, of which this is the second, entitled Ekphrasis, Creating a Space for Art and Literature. Ekphrasis in com contemporary literature is usually understood as a poetic description of a work of art. But over the course of these three seminars, we'll be introduced to different aspects of the practice, which might challenge the way we think about ekphrasis. Tonight's seminar featuring artist Richard Kenton Webb and poet Patrick Wright explores the way an artist might speak to a poet from the past and how contemporary poetry responds to abstract works of art. The three seminars in this series are going to bring together artists and writers to explore how each of them use images and texts from ancient and modern sources to create new works that speak to our time. <laughs> so I can hear a microphone that's still on, by the way. So do just all check before I hand over to Richard that your microphones are off. Thanks so much. So Richard Kenton Webb is an internationally acclaimed award-winning artist and subject lead of painting, drawing and printmaking at Plymouth College of Art. No, Arts University Plymouth. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what you get for reading from somebody's biog. My apologies, Richard. <laughs> um, I'm going, to, I'm going to attempt, I hope, to get the, the rest of this right. And I'm going to um, select a couple from a very extensive and impressive list of achievements. Um, so in 2020, he won first prize at the Sunny Art Prize, followed by a solo show, Hope in an Age of Anxiety, in 2021. And this year, He's joined the list of international names invited to the Joseph and Annie Albers residency in the USA, where he made in 72 drawings his manifesto of painting. This evening, Richard will discuss, as he says, a visual poet's conversation with John Milton's poems. And over to you, Richard. 
Right, I'm going to share my screen. So, let me press the button. Let me share. And, right, can you see that? Everybody? We can, Richard. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I want to start with uh, asking the question which is on your uh, flyer, which is, why am I in search of John Mil Milton? Or I might ask the question, why is John Milton in search of me? Um, his poet, his 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 poems. Um, I went to a John Martin exhibition in 2011, and um, I took my young son there, uh, Ez, and um, I was showing him some John Martin uh, meditants. And as we were looking at them, I said, um, he said, have you read um, Paradise Lost? And I went, no, no, I'm saving it. So he looked at me and he went, I think it's about time you read it. Dad. So I did. Um, and uh, so let me just, um, Really, so why am I here? To discuss Paradise Regained and Samson Agnosis. That's really what I want to show you tonight, but um, I need to talk to you about how I got there. Um, these two poems, his last two great poems, um, were published together and spoken into existence, um, not written down by him, of course, because he's blind, in 1671 in his, what is known now as Milton's Cottage in Chalford St Giles. Um, so really, to put it into context, how have I come to be in search of John Milton? Well, for 10 years, I conversed with um, this great man in the 12 uh, books of uh, Paradise Lost. So in 10 years, I made 179 artworks, um, 12 liner cuts, 40 paintings and 127 drawings, just to give you an idea. The drawings, uh, over a hundred of them, are this size, so they're over two foot by seven foot. And it was um, a labour of love. Um, and they, so here's some, just some drawings inside the studio when they're being made. So they're very much made in threes. Um, and as I said, you know, there's a considerable amount of them. 10 years of thinking. Um, and as I was coming near to the end, um, so that's there. And then I just want to show you. Um, so as I was coming to the end of them, uh, COVID hit um, and uh, I applied for the job that I am in now, which is at Arts University Plymouth, which is running the painting department here, BA and MA. And I still had two books, to, uh, two more books to make. Um, I moved down here, lived in, in, a, in a wooden hut by the sea in Wembury. And the problem for me as I was um, hitting COVID and we were, um, I was driving to work and um, had this, six, this is the exhibition that's in 2021, but during COVID um, and I'm finishing the, 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 the two books, I started thinking and reading um, the last two poems because I thought, well, I know how this ends and I know where it's going. And the work was, um, and I worked very intuitively, instinctively on, on the drawings, and you can see them all on my on my website. I started thinking about these two poems. Why were they published together? So during COVID, after I moved, and I not only read the poem many times, the two poems, I read, I started really reading a lot of criticism, papers, essays, commentaries about it, to try and understand what of other people think about the reason of why they're together. So this poem started to really bother me as I was finishing making work on uh, Paradise Lost. And I had some questions that I really wanted to ask Milton. Why have you put these two poems together? Why? And why these two specific narratives? Um, so from this epic, massive pictorial idea that is the, this genius of a poem of Paradise Lost, these two small, intimate dialogues and narrative. And what I found was two poems, concepts that were to be read in tandem. Two trials, two temptations, one about the perfect man, Jesus, and the other, Samson, the ruined, fallen, blind man. And so after this great epic poem, Paradise Lost, this is what he chose to write. This was his argument for hope in a hopeless age that he was living in, in Restoration uh, Britain, England. Um, 
And I configured it down as I was, um, uh, this is my kind of downtime in the evening of, uh, of um, in COVID. And um, I came down to these kind of um, 12 different, but, but six in duality ideas from one poem talking to the other poem. And they're, they're really what I want to talk to you about tonight. Um, but meanwhile, I had the other, other work to finish. I had a commission from the Milton Society of America for Lycidas to make um, uh, 12 drawings. And I had um, books 11 and 12 of Paradise Lost, plus also what bothered me about 10 years of making that I'd never dealt with the passion of Christ, which had really was so evident in making Paradise Lost. So I, I went to make those drawings. All those are on, on my website, um, which is live and you can see all that. Therefore, I kind of put it in, put it to bed in my mind, and I just waited for the right time, if there was going to be a right time to respond to it. So this is Lycidas, one drawing from Lycidas. This is one of the last, uh, this is from Paradise Lost, one of the small drawings. And this is from the Passion series. So then two years later, this summer, um, at last I was able to take up the Alba's residency that um, this is the, the third time I, I was trying to get there because the first time uh, there was a little a little bit of politics where I was working before that disallowed me to go. Um, then um, then COVID hit, uh, so that had to be put forward to this summer. So away I went in July and August. Um, and this extraordinary place uh, in Connecticut, uh, two studios, and I had it for two months in a wood. Uh, when I arrived, I was told that there was a bear lurking around, a very small bear, that, but the small bear I saw a photograph of was, was actually, if it stood up, was <laughs> much taller than me. Um, so it made uh, walking around it um, very interesting. I felt a bit like a ninja uh, going, you know, looking around my shoulder all the time. But anyway, this beautiful studio, um, and I just took 100 sheets of paper and waited to see what might turn up in my mind. But what turned up in my mind was a, a series of work thinking about a manifesto of painting. And so, um, which worked into seven parts. I mean, I didn't know I was going to make it in seven parts, but um, by the time I got to the seventh part, which was content, so this is this is a <laughs> retrospective about all the different seven parts. When I got to content, I started thinking about what should I make my content about and what would be a good example of that and what had been waiting and of course this poem had been waiting so I decided to start making work um, there and then in the studio so <laughs> this is a month into into the uh, residency um, on things that I'd spent a lot of time uh, considering but I'd made no drawings for uh, no sketches, nothing. Um, whereas Paradise Lost, I made hundreds of drawings before I um, and uh, before any of the paintings. Um, this time it was more I, I had marinated on an idea. Um, so what we have here, I'm going to show you um, a first drawing. So there's a, a suite of 12 drawings, six of each book. But my introductory drawing is me thinking uh, in America, but back in Plymouth, and it's raining, um, down in Wembury, and I'm by the roadside, and there's a car coming, and Milton, uh, I know he's blind, but Milton's driving the car, and uh, we're going to get in, and we're going to have a chat. So this is my um, waiting for Milton to have a chat with Milton about these two books, because I've got a lot of questions to ask him. And there's this strange white horse that always seems to stand at the top of the hill in, Mem in Wembury. Um, it's an imaginary thing, anyway. So what I decided was to give a day for each of the two drawings. So they were drawn in pairs, both together in one day, and they took approximately between 14 and 16 hours for the two drawings. And this, just showing you the way the suite works. So on the left-hand side is um, the first book, and then second book is Samson. And that's and I'm gonna go through them individually. So that's how I saw them as a suite of, um, of, of, of drawings. Um, so starting with Paradise for Grains, the, the first point, and 
what I felt we're, we, I'm looking at is how we perceive the world. So what we have this side is the way Christ is in the wilderness. So it's a story of Christ in the wilderness and against Samson in his wilderness. So first of all, I'm going to show you the first, first poem. Um, so Christ is peeling back um, a, sea, a sea scene and there's something underneath. So it's like, how are you perceiving this? And so he, though he's in the wilderness, he's in a theatre. He's seeing what's behind life. Um, then we have the first temptation. And what I felt was coming out in this was about how, um, how Milton's um, developing this character that Christ is slowly realizing that he is God and man. And it's this realization of this change. So just as Satan is tempting him, the change in the man of seeing who he is, which we'll see in Samson's story, he's changing too. First of all, he's a very, very angry man. And then it's a shift and a change. So we have more, th more theater. So the floorboards are there still. Um, and the edge of the theatre on the left hand side and here we have Satan and he's got some stones that he's trying to tempt um, Jesus to turn into bread but of course he's just reading his book and he's ignoring him and we've got a couple of characters to the right hand side um, kind of talking as in theatre because this is an idea so we have the second temptation and really what I feel he's kind of talking about is what is the real temptation to you? And we have suddenly upsprings an Italian cafe in the desert and Christ is half on the stone, half in the theater, half in the desert. And Satan with his insect wings is, uh, how can I serve you, sir? Um, I'll give you anything you want. It's all here, I've got everything. And he's ignoring him. Um, there is always humor in my work. Um, as well as deep seriousness. Um, then, of course, uh, there's violence against action that's then taken against Christ and against Samson. And he's got his, he's taking his book off him. Suddenly we're in a Beckett theatre now. We're in a King Lear. Uh, everything's gone. It's just, um, it's, it's ruthless. And then we're in the third uh, temptation. Um, which is the pinnacle where he is the perfect man and he's standing. And of course, I've just come back from New York and so New York is there. He's offering him the world and he's wearing um, his, his, his dancing shoes and Christ's still wounded uh, from being, being a, a violet, violated and he's offering him the, the kingdoms of the world. But of course he knows he's standing on a, on, on a stool, there's actually the stool in the studio, but um, and it's the his victory. It's a victory of his calm of mind of being focused and the reality that he's standing in a reality, his reality that he understands. So it's a paradise within. So I'm seeing where Milton from Paradise Lost wanted to take us by showing us the perfect man. So then Christ can get on with his narrative for his, his story, his passion. And there we have the fisherman. So, and it's, there's no theater anymore. It's a landscape and that's actually Wembley, uh, where I live. So then if we then turn to Samson and we have, oh, sorry. And we turn to Samson and we've got those six stories. So we see the blind poet. How do you see things? Well, he's just, he's had his hair shorn. He's just living in death. He's seeing only, well, he's not seeing anything. He's, inwardly, he's seeing just a graveyard. He's finished. He's angry with himself. He's made a complete bog up of his life. He's ruined who he was and the nation that he was in charge of. So these, these um, uh, tombs, he's living in his tombs um, and the tombs of like of, of, of nations. And so he's in the prison of his mind. So the doors are open and of course his hair's uh, growing and he's naked and he's just still completely at ang with himself. But he makes, starts making choices. So this is echoing what's happening in the Christ um, 
um, uh, narrative. And he's rejecting the, um, the movements of Delilah um, once again to, uh, he's saying, I've got to change. I've got to be different. Remember, he's blind and he's seeing beyond. He's starting actually in his blindness to be sighted. So everything's getting bigger and bigger and bigger because this is this is his weakness. And there are giants and just as there's giants and crisis in the violence to to Christ in the left hand, in the first poem. He's he's being violated um, and abused in in the cells, uh, Samson. But what we see is the calm of mind. He's made a decision to be to be to to be changed in the poem, and um, in his prison he is at one with himself about how he can change. And so then in the change he moves into his integrity about um, who he is as a person, and he pulls the buildings down, and there's a ruin. So. When we look um, how they were made as a conversation, the two modes, so we see Christ pulling back and, of course, Samson not seeing things, seeing only anger and feeling what he wants to feel. He's just, um, he's, he's overtaken with his own uh, anger. So there's a choice of which reality. And this is what I kind of feel, for me, um, I was getting from the poem, and then what I was enjoying making was the difference and the difference in the kind of amount of light and the kind of uh, dynamic between the, the two drawings. So the two drawings were worked like this all the time. First drawing, then the second drawing, and then it and, and, and changes. Um, so you see the way the theatre, that's a similar theatre in, in both ideas. Then where choice is really made. Christ uh, ignoring and so Samson ignoring and then the violence the violence two different types so they're both paired back and a sense of light in both of them where it's a stark light and a stark light revealing the giants revealing the bullies who bully us and um, there's a great series of study called the pinnacle in the prison I really recommend it if you want a uh, series of essays um, written in the early late 60s I think so Rob, what we hear what we get to in the two poems is a calm of mind calm of mind of Christ right at where he's on the pinnacle of the temple and where Samson's in 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 the depths of the prison but he is he's free he's free in his mind at last so the paradise within is Christ getting on and doing things and um, sadly Samson uh, but destroying all of the enemy. So that's how I then put them together and contemplated them as a series and seeing them. But the introduction of um, the, uh, the amusing thing of meeting Milton is a really important part of it. It's seeing it as, as where I go with it. So what relevance has John Milton, I'll be very quick now, what relevance has John Milton's poems written over 350 years ago have for an artist in the 20th century? It's the complementarity of and coupled with its simultaneously epic and intimate. Um, again, I think as in Paradise Loft, there's this extraordinary thing of a great love story. It's, grilling, it's dealing with great concepts. For me as, a, as an artist, it, the poems enable me to play, invent, improvise. He's always using landscape as a place of journey, a rite of passage, a metaphor that mirrors our own life in that sense of it's both big and it's intimate. Uh, they're psychological, psychological choices with great implication and they're timeless. OK, I'm coming to the end. Two publications. I've got a publication with Oxford University Press coming out next year, discussing Paradise Lost. I've got a show coming out next year in London at Benjamin Rhodes Arts. Do come along to it. And in 2024, um, these will be showing in the very place that these were spoken out. End. And I need to stop sharing. 
thank you so okay. much. Thank you so much, Richard, for that fascinating thank paper. You, oh, it was great to see some multiple conversations taking place between the art artworks different um the different um uh, series of artworks and also um uh, this this poetry um and the way that you were making contact with those really important themes so thank you i'm sure lots of people are going to be um busily thinking um about the questions they'd like to ask so do write those in the chat um and yeah. we will return to them um but i'm now going to turn to um our second paper of the evening which is presented by patrick wright um patrick um is uh, um i beg your pardon sorry <laughs> um patrick's debut um poetry collection full sight of her was published in 2020 and he's been shortlisted for the bridport prize he teaches english literature and creative writing at the open university where he's also finishing a doctorate in creative writing in which he explores writing poetry in response to modern art his um, thesis is entitled exit strategy Ekphrasis through the lens of the abstract and the formless. I'll hand over to you, Patrick. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me all right? Welcome to this uh, talk. Thanks for attending this evening really appreciate it i'm just going to get up my powerpoint just bear with me a moment so as you'll see the title this evening is exploded form the ekphrasis of culinary parker's cold dark matter and this paper emerges from my PhD thesis in creative writing at the Open University, supervised by Siobhan Campbell and Jane Ye. Um, as has just been suggested there, I'm currently between the submission of the thesis and the viva. Um, and this is the title, Exit Strategy, uh, Traces Through the Lens of the Abstract and the Formless. And, um, just want to begin with saying that the inspiration for my PhD began with wondering how I might write a poem in response to Mark Rothko's Seagram murals. Here we see an example, paintings that are dominated by colour and essentially formless. Moreover, I was, read, I was led by my observation of a bias in the tradition of ekphrasis towards figurative artworks that contain characters, scenes, and so on, or those that suggest a narrative. A canonical example of the latter is W.H. Auden's Musée des Beaux-Arts, in response to Bruegel's landscape with the fall of Icarus, as we see here. It's worthwhile just pausing on the distinction between the previous image and this one. Given that there is little in terms of subject matter in a painting such as Rothko's, I've looked to develop modes of ekphrasis that keep description to a minimum, that use misperception or colour, for example, as a basis for moving away from the image. These modes are usually blended with the lyric, the result being what I understand as a lyric poem yet one crafted through the lens of the artwork. This lens, I find, allows personal themes to be disguised, warped, or treated differently. Indeed, I was drawn to formless artworks because they resonate with personal experience of grief. These senseless or elliptical forms seemingly analogous with my inner sense of devastation. If loss can be traumatic, incomprehensible, and raise unanswerable metaphysical questions, some modern art, I assume, is able to harmonize with and thus assuage the shattering of meaning that words are not able to address, at least initially. 
in this sense, images sometimes work for me as metaphors between the indescribable pain of loss and poems which, rather than escape grief, formally represent it. Just as grief is recursive, circular, and often impenetrable, I've found kinship in streaks of light and color, or in fragments and shards, as we see here with the example of the Cornelia Parker. The practice of moving away from the image can also be seen in the work of many contemporary poets, such as Anne Carson, Emily Barry and Darren Reese jones Setting aside for now their reasons for doing so, my need to escape, to pursue what I call an exit strategy, is often due to how the image is too immersive or overwhelming. Within this context, I saw Cornelia Parker's Cold Dark Matter, an exploded view, to give it its full title, as a representation of my grief. More specifically, this, this installation provided a metaphor at an intuitive level of the traumatic experience of taking apart my partner's home in the days after her funeral and redistributing her belongings. On the installation itself, I paraphrase a description from the Tate Gallery website. Here we have the restored contents of a garden shed exploded by the British Army at the request of the artist. The surviving pieces have been used to create an installation suspended from the ceiling as if held mid explosion. Lit by a single light bulb, the fragments cast dramatic shadows on the gallery's walls. Depicting objects that are burnt, crushed, or destroyed in some way is a recurrent motif in Parker's work, and the explosion is what the artist perceives as an archetypal or iconic image of something that's happened in a split second, but could also be made to have a durational aspect to it. And I saw this as comparable to my own experience of grief, which is at once durational and timeless. The following is my poem, which I will now read to you now. This is called An Exploded View alongside Cornelia Parker. Hinge bracket spin in a vortex, still as a supernova remnant. Pine lap panels stripped by wasps, hung on fishing wires, just because if I learn to love the bomb, perhaps it will look like this, fixed in a millisecond, like smiles in JPEGs on external drives. At my center is a single light bulb. Now a sky dance of swallows, or galaxies just fly apart. Your toys, tools, left behind clothes, your LPs all screaming, let me go. My title borrows from Parker's, where I suggest a tenuous and metaphorical relationship with the image. To stress a dynamic of mutuality, that the image determines the poem just as much as the poem represents the image. I changed the first word of the standard epigraph after. For me, this familiar epigraph suggests a relationship of dominance over the image, an image traditionally seen as fixed, silent, and feminine. To subvert this and imply an ongoing dialogue, I've used the word alongside. There's some element of description, e.g. hinge brackets, though I shift away from reference to the shed and go on to explore associated imagery, e.g. a supernova remnant, or later a sky dance of swallows. The voice also shifts from a more conventional lyric I to a more ambiguous speaker, which might be the artwork, ventriloquized or made to speak, or the lost other speaking, e.g. at my center is a single light bulb. There's the light bulb in the installation, but this is also a metaphor perhaps of the soul or love or the continuing, continuing trace of a person after death. Particularly through rereading Anne Carson's poems, I explored how my handling of punctuation and grammar could be mimetic of the artwork. It occurred to me that because modern art often includes incongruity, 
and fragments. My equivalent could be dependent clauses, paratexis, and word collage. I associate punctuation with lines and edges in visual art. And it follows that, that if there are no lines in the image or broken or disrupted lines, I might avoid punctuation as a procedural strategy. Seeing phrases like fractured bits of shed allowed me to embrace a compositional process where I was more attentive to sound, rhythm, and the graphical aspects of the poem on the page. In an exploded view, I fused some procedures, marginal configuration, space between phrases, non secateurs, and so on. Initial drafts were driven by overlapping the lexicons of art history and astrophysics, the title Cold Dark Matter, evoking something of this subject, and two poems were amalgamated into a new one. This approach was also inspired by, by Ezra Pound somewhat and T.S. Eliot's multi-referential collage poetry, celebrating fragments and intertextuality. In my poem, though, I amplify what these poets do by having procedures aligned with my aim to represent the artist's decimated installation. Constraints were, I found, generative, such as how I prohibited my use of commas from the very beginning, the absence of which I saw as visually reminiscent of the gaps between the parts of the shed. This poem is also emblematic of how I've explored the use of reproductions and remediation. For example, I've sometimes responded to artworks viewed in art history books on postcards or as JPEG files through computer screens or smartphones. Though I was already working with reproductions prior to the pandemic, I began to place greater emphasis on this methodology around spring 2020 and in the wake of lockdowns. Denied access to galleries and museums, I utilized my phone and tablet screen, the black mirror of contemporary Western culture. I did so to view specific artworks, but I also looked at online exhibitions, virtual gallery tours, and spent more time with prints from books and exhibition catalogues. This placed an extra burden on my active imagination and reaffirmed my themes of loss and separation. Many instances of ekphrasis have a gallery or museum experience in mind where the act of making a poem occurs alongside an artwork. Barbara Fisher observes this kind of juxtaposition in museum mediations. She values American poetry that locates itself self-consciously in the museum, taking in the viewing experience and everything around the artwork and poets who study the effects of their site specificity on their interactions. In this context, it's worth noting that a recent workshop run by Tamar Yosloff was on responses to Parker, part, the Parker retrospective at Tate Britain. For this in-person event, Yosloff outlined I quote, themes of process and transformation, suspension of time and reshaping of space, end quote. Though I have at times continued this tradition and I acknowledge the loss of sensory input, e.g. the chatter of other gallery visitors, my use of reproductions does not, as I see it, result in reduced experience or an inferior poem. Instead, I see reproductions as stimulating in other ways working within a new set of constraints and new technologies, away from galleries and first-hand viewings, I was led to question notions of authenticity and immediacy in creative practice. David Kinlock refers to how poets can often envy the perceived immediacy or access to the real that is inherent in the visual arts. Frank O'Hara's poem, Why I Am Not a Painter, comes to mind where this idea of immediacy is initially entertained only to be later contested. My attitude to this and how ekphrasis is already one step removed from the artwork has been to embrace the irreconcilability of word and image that the relationship between the visual and the verbal is as Foucault saw it infinite. I also celebrate how a poem like a painting can depart from its prompt. 
using reproductions is supported by Andrew Miller's observation that, I quote, such modern ekphrases as William Carlos Williams's Pictures of Bruegel and Auden's Musée de Beaux-Arts were written by way of photographic reproductions, end quote. He questions the cult of authenticity in Western art and proposes the idea that the most famous modern ekphrases are panegyrics of what Walter Benjamin understood as the aura of traditional art. Moving away from authenticity or fidelity to an artwork, ekphrasis, or what's often thought of as a response or remediation, is a practice that can be multimodal, nuanced, and involve only a tenuous link between word and image. The connective tissue can be fragile. Thinking along these lines, I was also drawn to Andre Malraux's idea of the imaginary museum and Benjamin's essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, how art is now more accessible to the public through the internet, for example. Recognizing this and the problem of rediscovering a substitute aura through digital technology became one concern. This is represented in my poem where Parker's installation is even more emphatically fixed, as I write in a millisecond, by the images I worked with on my screen. This mediation also reminded me of photographs of my lost partner. Cold dark matter is compared as a result to smiles and JPEGs on external drives, where the real or what seems to be authentic or have auratic value is at my center, a single light bulb. Mats Jensen on the overlap of ekphrasis and digital media writes that, I quote, digital technologies entail new possibilities and challenges for the production and reception of ekphrasis. The ekphrastic poet is given the opportunity not only to write a poem describing a work of art, but to create a multimedial artwork involving several senses, end quote. I found this observation inspiring and I had the idea to visually evoke Parker's installation with a new use of form. Without seeing Parker's artwork firsthand, I began by recalling the reproductions I had thus far made a study of, such as slides in a lecture theater many years ago as an art history student. My visualization of her shed frozen in time led to an image in my mind's eye of how the poem might look. My, my words were then, analogously exploded around the page. As part of my research, I consulted Google Images, which provided a series of viewpoints of cold dark matter under different lighting. I was also aware that the device through which I looked, an iPhone, made the images difficult to see and subject to chance reflections. In this poem, the technology with its filters and frustrations becomes part of what I write about along with my often incongruous lived milia, e.g. a sky dance of swallows. To conclude, what I call expanded ekphrasis might refer to ways in which I move away from description and dilate the word image relationship. It might also mean inviting modern or contemporary artwork such as Parker's installation to shape my poem. This can result in poems Sorry. This can result in poems which re represent the visual features of the image, e.g. my exploded forms, or where decisions on layout and typography take on meaning. Visual form, in other words, can help me decide in advance or during the process the rules of the poem, e.g. not using punctuation, and it can determine the poetic form, such as bands of colour that correspond with stanzas or a tabulated arrangement on the page. I understand the poems in my collection where an exploded view is just one example, as lyric poems generated through the prism of art. I believe this has given rise to a personally inflected writing about grief particularly, where rather than directly expressing my innermost thoughts and feelings, my poem represents something unspeakable. 
this leads me to consider that microphrasis is a disguised mode, mode of confessionalism. Furthermore, my collection's title, Exit Strategy, in addition to referring to a grief process and its end, implies that my approach might be better understood as finding a way out of the artwork rather than finding a way in. My experiments in pushing the envelope of ekphrastic practice especially my efforts to distend or obfuscate the relationship between artwork and the poem, has to some extent challenged the usefulness of ekphrasis as a viable term. While this is not problematic in my practice, often it has been liberating. The new modes I am working with stretch the definition of ekphrasis even further, perhaps to a point where it becomes redundant. Thanks for listening. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and I would appreciate um, if anyone interested in further discussion would get in touch. Thanks very much. Patrick, thank you um, for the superb analysis and for um, sharing such a powerful poem as well. Um, Now's the time, folks, um, for um, you to start um, collecting together your questions. You can either post them in the um, chat box or I believe, Joanne, can they also put their hands up? Am well, I if, somebody want, if somebody wants to ask, they can, but we do have some questions which we could lovely, lovely. start well, with. Um, OK, well, I, I, I just had one thing I wanted to um, raise if that's okay and um before that um which was just that whilst i was listening to these two papers that i was really struck by the different temporalities that came into play um through both of your papers and the ways uh, that, that the papers maybe then speak to one another the life phases places you've been either emotionally or physically or virtually digitally richard's conversation with poetry made in the 17th century and the sort of timeless quality of the allegorical imagery you use in your drawings um, and this sort of concept of immediacy which always seems to be hovering when we discuss ekphrasis. Um, I just wondered if both of you could perhaps comment briefly about you know the relevance of temporality in your ekphrastic practice, how time works for you um who, who who can come in on that patrick well it, i would emphasize that it is a process it I've, in my practice at least i certainly haven't there's been there's been very rare occasions where i've sat in a gallery and responded descriptively to the artwork and even when, even when i tried to do that in a in a particular moment in time the results weren't something that I was too satisfied with. It, it lacked something, um, maybe it needed to go through a process um, and for some durational aspect to play out. So in, in my practice, usually uh, there's been some kind of immediacy that's been involved, maybe a visit or I've looked at a reproduction. Usually though, I will work back into it and I will revisit over, over the process of time that image again and again, and it will inform the revision. And that's, that's it works in, di in different ways with different poems, but it's nearly always involved that kind of temporality. Thanks so much, Patrick. And, and Richard, how about you? Um, my temporality is really through the materials. Um, so I'm, I'm, I've spent a lot of time pondering and um, if you like conversing with a, with a with a well I think a voice actually more um I think of Milton because I do really think of him as as blind speaking um so I'm listening to uh, a voice um which I feel is timeless and I'm kind of thinking why and what and um but his voice is so pictorial so when I'm listening I'm seeing it I'm seeing something and then I'm seeing questions and so therefore, that's why I don't feel I'm illustrating. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm more having a a, a conversation, um, but then I'm having a conversation with materials, um, and because my language, the languages I'm using, the visual languages, 
are beyond words. Um, I'm then the materials themselves are restricting or they're opening up or they're challenging. And then there's the sense of play that one is putting something down and seeing something different and thinking, oh, what, what's that? Or, or looking at something backwards um, and saying, well, I didn't, I didn't anticipate that. Or, um, I mean, a lot of the drawings that I did for these two poems were also affected by the drawings that came before. So I just made some drawings about very a platonic idea about not knowing thinking about the fogs beside the sea. And that was a perfect device for the fog that I feel that, the, of the wilderness, of uh, that, that, that Jesus was seemingly in a wilderness of the desert, but not. And, and that sense of how we perceive the world. Um, by limiting the materials, I, they, challenged me to see things differently and then I reach back into the poem I think oh god that's just like that that's what he's saying um so the temporality is the, being in the moment of being in the moment of kind of um it's like jumping in a swim, swimming pool when you start making a, a drawing or a painting you're in the materials and the materials are going no you don't or they go oh uh you know they make the so new things happen it's like food you've just you, know, it, you start tasting different things and you you're and I'm it's the wonder of materials like I sense the wonder in reading Milton that Thank because it, and, it, and it's timeless I just feel Milton I go oh yes yes thank you well I, I'm I can I can see that you're you've been collecting questions joanne um yeah uh, i got um, it's making me want to read milton i me remember me too oh, yeah <laughs> going back to milton i should say um so i'm going to start with one that goes for, to both um is the relationship between poetry and art essential or could do other artistic forms feature in this apparent collaboration for example music novels films so um i don't know who wants to go first maybe richard <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they all do. It's all there. I mean, you know, I'll go and see if, you know, I'm going, we've got a great art cinema here, so I see films and you go, oh, and then you'll see something and you go, that's just what he was saying. And you, and you think, who was saying? Milton. And you think, what, you're talking about a 17th century poet? Yeah, but it's just, he's saying the same thing. <laughs> he's saying the same thing that this filmmaker's saying. Or, and it's, so yes, and music too. Um, yeah, I mean, it's all feeds, it's all food, isn't it, to, of, of how we live in the world and have our being in the world. Um, so, yeah, I'm affected by. But the poets, poets, musicians and painters, they're talking about something else. They're just freer. Revolutionaries. <laughs> There's been such a long tradition, hasn't there, of correspondences between between literature and visual arts, and I, I see that no end to that. I think that it will continue to be relevant in contemporary poetic practice, um, and you know, I think that you know writers will always be inspired. I think by the still image and look to look at ways of animating that and and project their imaginations into the still image. I think that today, because we live in such a high paced visual culture, the, there's something really radical about sitting down in a gallery and, and devoting some time to a still image and, and exploring that with, with an active imagination. In terms of the future, I, I think that uh, it's something I've written about a little in the PhD that it would be good and appropriate, I think, given the array of different kinds of media now that we enjoy, um, such as TV series or, or music, um, that we uh, explore that too. And, and that's one way in which ekphrasis can develop now moving forward. It doesn't have to be that still image. I think it, it can still exert a force and we should continue to explore different modes of interaction with it. But I think it would be great to broaden that out now 
and look at other kinds of correspondences between different media. Thanks. I can see we're coming up to time. So I've got one for Patrick and one for Richard is probably a good way to do it. Um, so I'm just going to read it out. Patrick, it's quite it's quite long. So uh, it's actually a question I had. So I'm quite I, I want to ask this one. Um, it's thank you. First of all, it's fascinating to hear about the effects COVID has had on viewing art. Is there a worry about there being an additional almost insidiously tacit veil of perspective? when someone has a camera or phone between you and your experience of the art or installation, you're not able to see it with your own eyes, but necessarily from an angle that someone else has decided upon. Yeah, well, it's timely because just a few days ago, I visited the Cezanne exhibition at Tate Modern, and it was, that was very much the experience that I had. The, the room was absolutely crammed full of tourists with cameras. And I have to admit, I was one of them. <laughs> yeah, so I, I took the opportunity to. Um, I mean, it, I, I did mourn and, and lament a little that it, it wasn't an empty room because I think it would have been a, a different kind of experience. And it's one that I yearn for actually when I go to a gallery. I actually want to be alone with the image if possible. So it's a different kind of experience, but as I suggest in what I've just written, I, I don't think it's of any less um, inspirational or it's not that there's not a lack of material there to work with. I just think it becomes a different kind of poem then. It becomes a, a, the incorporation of, of a different set of dynamics that you experience in that room. So it's still exciting for me and I've made use of it. Um, and I'm sad about it at times. Um, but, but what, I, what I do have to take away with me is that still image that because I, I did take some photographs and it, it does lead me to reflect upon, um, you know, which is the, the, the best way of working, at least for myself. You know, is it actually in the gallery or is it better for me to go home and work with my own photographs or even a reproduction in a book? Um, so the, I'm still thinking about that right now. Um, I see value in both kinds of experiences. Yeah, thank you. That I wanted to ask that question as well, actually. So, yeah. Did you want to add anything to that, Richard? Or I've got a question. Yeah, I got a really strong views against uh, uh, that, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the hegemony of sight is, is really uh, a very destructive thing for practicing um, painters, artists, it, because it's about the physical, the physical alchemy, um, the alchemy between the materials and the artist concepts. And so being in with the object, with the art piece, the, the, the artist is pickled in that piece, uh, whether it's a drawing, a painting, a sculpture in that, their very thinking has, um, is there still. And so when you're in front of that object and you're encountering it, you, you, you know, whether it's Rembrandt, however many is, or you're, you're encountering the thing itself rather than a flat digital, ex, you know, the one's senses uh, um, and one's being is, um, is, is awakened fully rather than just sight orientated. Um, I'm very concerned about, um, yeah, the hegemony of sight. Lin <laughs> Lindsay, do we have time for one question? I think we've got two minutes, haven't we? I think um, we could just fit in another little okay. one, Joanne. It's quite interesting. Um, it's for you, Richard. Your hearing of Milton seems to be quite modern, contemporary. Many new writers might imitate Milton's idiom, but your medium seems to escape that tendency. You bring it into today. Is that true? Um, well, I live in today. Um, so yeah, I feel, yeah, it, it's like, is it contemporary? Um, yes. Um, one, one of the things I had a, um, a, a wrestling match with was, um, book three in Paradise Lost is only, is all paintings and it's, it's a color contract and it's what I'm writing the essay in the Oxford University Press book that comes out next year. Um, and the rest are line drawings. And the wonderful thing about line drawing is in, in the eye-brain relationship, it's neither tone nor color. It's pure shorthand. It's, it's a mental neurological shorthand for the world. 
which means it's timeless too. And it's got, um, and it, it can be talking about color and it can be talking about tone. Um, and it's other, um, it's, it's not like reality. It's like, it's in that true William Blake imagination. It's the it's and it's full of materials too, very limited materials to imagine other things, which is what I get in especially in listening to someone reading out Paradise or reading out Milton, because, of course, he's blind. So he's he's practicing. And when you go to Milton's cottage, just think. And it's amazing. Milton's cottage. You walk around that. That's where he spoke it into existence. It's goosebump time. And you think, and though my drawings are going to be there. And it's just things, and that sense of um, voice, the voice and um, voice and image, or voice and object, encountering the object, encountering the voice spoken. Anyway, I don't know if I really have answered your question. <laughs> and well, I. I don't know either, but but I, I just want to come back around to that phrase, imagining other things, because I think that's probably what both of um, you um, have brought to us this evening. And um, I, for one, feel very privileged to have been um, able to um, hear you both. So thanks so much. Um, and um, I'm sure everybody uh, will uh, want to echo that. And um, thank you very much for um, coming along, everybody. Thank, thank you. And I, yeah. and I would just like to finish by saying thank you to you, Lindsay, for chairing tonight. And of course, to our two speakers, Richard and Patrick. It was wonderful. Um, there's loads of questions, comments in there being so complimentary of you both. You've got a quick, you can have a quick scan, but I can probably pass them on to you both. Um, so just to let you know, in two weeks, we have our final seminar, Beyond Ekphrasis. I think a message was put in earlier about that. Um, it's on the Tuesday, the 29th of November, featuring poet Maria Isakova Bennett and uh, novelist and textile artist Heather Richardson. Um, links for the booking are in the chat box or on our Contemporary Cultures of Writing website. So we hope to see you there. And thank you. That was fantastic. <laughs>